Our next speaker is Daria Benutmas, who's from Jackson Labs. She's one of the directors of the new, one of the new centers. And uh, we're looking forward to hear him talk about um, the immunologic perspectives that he's bringing to our knowledge of this disease. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Joe Breen and other organizers. Uh, this is a very important meeting, great pleasure and honor to be here. I um, guess my slides are about to come out. Okay, so uh, I'm a human immunologist, so I'm going to focus on immunology uh, and tell you uh, some of our uh, unpublished results. Uh, so our overall hypothesis is that uh, the immune system is at the center of what um, causes or maybe uh, results in ME-CFS symptoms. Um, and that perturbation in the immune system could be due to a variety of reasons, such as uh, disruption in the microbiome that I'm going to mention, and you heard about metabolism, and of course, uh, infections, viral or bacteria could trigger that. Uh, I'm also directing the, uh, one of the collaborative research centers for MECFS at Jackson Laboratory. This is an NIH-funded uh, uh, application. And in that uh, project, uh, what we are trying to do is take a systems biology approach uh, using clinical samples, uh, doing uh, very extensive immune profiling, metabolomics, and microbiome, and try to come up with uh, computational approaches to make sense out of that. Uh, the data that I'm going to show you today actually are from a different cohort that have started a couple of years ago. That was a more cross-sectional study that we uh, completed at least the first set of analysis. And this is still ongoing. We have, uh, this is a longitudinal study and we're still collecting uh, patient samples for that. And our goal is twofold. One is to identify specific biomarkers that can define MECFS. And actually, more importantly, I'm going to stress at the end, is to be able to stratify the patients because we think this is a very, very heterogeneous disease. Uh, and of course, uh, hopefully that will lead us uh, to novel targets that we can uh, use to uh, develop some new therapeutics. So why immune system? Why this is really important? So as most of you know, we really need our immune system to defend against infectious diseases and, and uh, resolve the uh, inflammation that results from that. That's the good part. And as you just heard, there's also the bad part of the immune system that can result in autoimmunity, allergies, and overreaction of the immune system to infectious disease, uh, cause a septic shock, uh, cause uh, great suffering and, and mortality. And there's also an ugly side of the immune system that we don't always think too much, uh, but that is uh, something that we think is extremely important, uh, which is a result of chronic inflammation. It, it's sort of a subtle type of inflammation that happens uh, which creates uh, chronic uh, illnesses. And we think that this is really important in, in biomedicine in general, uh, we, that this inflammation, immune response perturbation can trigger or uh, contribute to a variety of chronic diseases, including Alzheimer's, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and, and so on, and perhaps also is involved in MECFS in a, in a different uh, manner. Of course, there are different flavors of inflammation, and that's something that we are trying to figure out. So uh, I am, a, as I said, I'm a human immunologist, and I've been studying a particular subset of cells that you just heard about uh, from one of the leaders in the field um, uh, called T cells. And you can imagine T cells as sort of the, let's say, the generals or the regulators of the immune system. And there are many, many types of T cells because uh, there are many types of pathogens and uh, parasites, bacteria, viruses, and for each particular type of pathogen, you need to develop a certain type of immune response. And not only that, you have to regulate this, and we, we uh, have identified at least one subset of cell called regulatory T cells. There's critically important, if you don't regulate these immune responses, you get autoimmunity and all these overreactions uh, during inflammation. And then you have these uh, subset of cells. You can divide them into conventional and unconventional T cells. Uh, we heard about the, the conventional T cells. Uh, that basically recognize MHC peptide molecules in the context of MHC molecules. But then you have these unconventional T cells, a little bit less studied, um, that recognize uh, small molecules. Um, this is a particular cell type I'm going to mention called mucosa associated invariant T cells that uh, recognize uh, uh, metabolites derived from a riboflavin pathway uh, actually produced by bacteria in the context of a molecule called MR1. 
uh, another type of cell called natural killer T cells, recognize glycolipids, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the complexity does not stop there. There are also many flavors of, uh, of these cell types. Uh, uh, not only we can divide them based on the type of cytokines that they produce, effective functions, but also where they go in the body. And that is uh, mapped by uh, a set of molecules called chemokine receptors or integrins, such as CCR6, CCR4. Uh, one of the problems in immunology, there are so many different uh, names and jargon uh, it's, I know it's difficult to, to re recall these things, but basically think of them as sort of zip codes. Uh, for example, cells that have CCR6 tend to go to the gut or skin, or if they have CCR4, they might go to lungs. And of course, uh, having the right immune response in the right location is also critically important. And you have cells that make different types of cytokines, combinatorial effects, and so on. And we're still trying to figure out what is this functional diversity. There's probably dozens of different types of uh, uh, T cells that we haven't yet uh, identified. So there's another set of complexity, and that is the microbes within us. Uh, there are trillions of bacteria that live in us, uh, especially in our gut, in our skin, in our mucosal tissues, uh, that really shapes our immune system and, and our biology in general. Uh, and in fact, this microbiome, what we call the microbiota, is extremely diverse. Uh, there are different types of phyla and species, and each person has a different set of uh, strains that are sort of unique to them. Uh, that also can be dynamic, that changes by different uh, uh, conditions, such as your diet, antibiotic use, and so on. Uh, but we are re really beginning to appreciate that this is extraordinarily important, and if there is a perturbation uh, in this equilibrium that is set by uh, these microbes that, that could result in inflammation and autoimmunity and variety of, of problems. Um, uh, and, uh, and this could happen by many reasons. Uh, you know, going to McDonald's is probably not a good idea. Uh, use of uh, high level of antibiotics and so on results in this microbial Im imbalance that we call dysbiosis that results in many types of uh, chronic illnesses and perhaps we think uh, also MECFS. And you'll hear more about this uh, tomorrow uh, from Julio at, from Jackson Laboratory, part of our uh, group uh, who studies the, the, the microbes. So this is all great, but as uh, late Richard Feynman, the, the famous uh, physicist, said, it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is, it doesn't matter how smart you are, if it doesn't agree with the experiment, it's wrong. So let's see what the experiments and the data tell us. So first of all, I want to tell you uh, how we study the immune system and uh, sort of put a context into the data that I'm going to show you. Uh, the, the key uh, instrument or the approach that we take is uh, profiling the immune cells and their functionality using a machine called flow cytometry. Uh, and basically what we do is we label the cells with different antibodies that are conjugated to different fluorocorn molecules and you can identify specific subpopulations using this approach. There are lasers that can detect these fluorescent molecules, and you get this uh, deconvoluted in a, in a, uh, uh, decoded in a computer program, and that will show you different sets of data. An example of this for here shown, uh, we can detect uh, T cells in the blood. Uh, this is a, detected by a marker called CD3. Uh, and then you can say, okay, what's the complexity within the T cells? Now we can do 15, 20, even 30 different colors in a single tube. Uh, you can see, you know, they're, they're made up of CD4, CD8 positive T cells, and it, we heard about this again. And there are double negatives, and then you can go in even deeper and say what's, what's within CD4 cells. We can divide them based on their, uh, uh, th these markers that d define them as naive cells, as memory cells, as effector cells. Naive cells are the ones that haven't seen their antigen. As they see their antigen, they become activated in effector, and the memory cells are long-lived. That's the basis of vaccines and our memory to infectious diseases. Uh, and the same is true for CD8 and CD4 cells. And of course, you can go deeper and deeper and look at their functionality that I'm going to show some of that as well. Okay, so uh, using this, uh, we've actually uh, performed this very detailed immune analysis, and I'm going to only be able to show, based on the time that I have, a very uh, small uh, a snapshot um, uh, from, uh, in collaboration with Cindy Bateman here uh, from Utah, uh, close to 200 MECFS patients and about close to 100 uh, healthy controls. Uh, of course, most of them are female, uh, and most have long uh, duration of, of disease. Uh, this is a cross-sectional study. As I had mentioned, the new study that we're performing is a longitudinal study, and we're actually focusing more on the people with shorter term of, of, of illness. 
And so it'll be very interesting to compare those results as well. And, and now we have also built in metabolomics and microbiome on top of that. Okay, so uh, what, what happens in ME-CFS patients? Um, so we've started uh, looking at the T-cell populations from the very high level, you know, what's the proportion of the T-cells, CD4, CD8, and to be honest, I wasn't really expecting anything particular there because these are very high level analysis, but to our surprise, uh, we actually saw differences even in uh, CD4 and CD8 uh, populations, that the, the frequency of uh, CD4 T cells were, were higher and the CD8 cells were lower. And of course, this is actually the old, most T cells are made up of CD4 or CD8, so if one goes down, one goes up. And if you make a ratio, um, um, uh, oh, sorry, got to go back. Uh, then the ratio, of course, is also uh, higher for CD4, CD8 in ME-CFS uh, patients. So this was very interesting, especially the, the CD8 population uh, uh, looking, looking lower. Uh, so uh, then we said, so well, maybe there's some correlation with age, because we know by age, with age these populations change. And we, when we look at healthy subjects, in fact, uh, we, we find that uh, during age, uh, as, as you get older, these uh, proportions change, and there's a, uh, also the, the, the proportions of CD4 to CD8 also are changing. So I said, okay, maybe this was a kind of superfluous data, uh, but let's, let's look at this more carefully. So we divided the patients right in the middle, sort of right at the 50 age, and looked at those who are older than 50 years old and those who are under 50 years old, and there things start to get uh, pretty interesting. Um, and in fact, uh, anyone uh, who was over the age of uh, 50, we couldn't really see at least significance between the healthy controls who were also over the age of 50. But the under the age of 50, we found that both CD4 and CD8 uh, ratio. So the, the significance was actually coming from this younger uh, cohort, and the same was true uh, also for the, uh, the ratios as well. So for those that, that were younger than 50 years old, the, the CD4, CD8 ratio, was, um, was actually changing compared to the healthy controls. And then we went a little bit deeper and asked, uh, so what's the level of memory naive and so on? Um, uh, there was no difference in the CD4 memory uh, populations between the controls, but uh, again, uh, within the CD8, uh, there was actually a, a, a quite high, significantly increased uh, memory subset. So what does this mean? So basically, you know, if, if, the, if the CD8 cells, which recognize viral epitopes mostly, uh, are activated, they will turn into memory and effector cells. So, so that could perhaps suggest that, at least in some of the patients, remember this is a heterogeneous condition, that uh, this could be uh, a, a sort of a viral trigger that resulted in this high level of, of CD8 um, uh, activation. And when we looked at the age, again, you know, over in 50 uh, age groups, uh, no difference in CD4 memory, uh, but uh, in the CD8 group, uh, you know, lower than uh, age 50, we, we find that the, the memory population was increased. One thing that's a little bit striking is that if you look at the over 50, uh, it starts to look like uh, the under the 50 ME patients, even the healthy controls. Um, so that suggests that perhaps there's an accelerated differentiation or accelerated aging of the immune system in these patients, and that difference uh, starts to, to get lost as you, as you get older. Uh, this is something that we have observed in HIV patients in a, in a reverse manner in some cases, that there is this accelerated aging, uh, quote unquote, uh, in their immune system due to the chronic uh, inflammatory uh, responses. So that was a very, very interesting. Um, so another subset of t cells that we were very interested to study is called TH17 cells. You heard a little bit about this. These cells make IL-17, and IL-17 is a very important cytokine involved in many different functions. I don't have time to go over most of these things, but they can cause inflammation. It could cause uh, damage or re uh, regulation of the immune cells and, and uh, other epithelial cells and, and osteoblasts and so on and so forth. In fact, uh, there was a report that uh, IL-17 is even involved in pain uh, uh, in, in certain contexts. Uh, uh, but more importantly, TH17 cells are also uh, uh, very much influenced by the microbiota and my, uh, the, the bacteria that live in the gut. Uh, they probably regulate the microbiome, and the microbiome regulates these TH17 cells. So based on our hypothesis, we, uh, we wanted to study this, and this is a population we studied for many years in other contexts, uh, and so we were keen to see what happens in ME-CFS patients. 
And so to do this analysis is a little bit uh, different than looking at just surface phenotypes. Uh, so in order to identify T17 cells, you have to actually elicit the cytokine they produce called IL-17. So you have to stimulate them with something like PMA and ionomycin, and then you have to stain them intracellularly using antibodies. You have to permalize a cell that goes inside the cell and stain these cytokines, IL-17, different gamma, IL-22, and so on, so that that really truly identifies those that make IL-17. But there's another way to identify sort of cells that, are def that, that has the propensity to become TA17, and that is the molecule called CCR6. This is one of the chemokine receptors that are expressed by these cells. In fact, when you do this type of experiment, you find that almost all IL-17 expression is in CCR6 positive cells. The CCR6 negative cells uh, have negligible amounts. Uh, and then you can see that there are different subset of TA17, those that make interferon gamma, that don't make interferon gamma, and so on. Uh, and then there's a portion of cells that don't seem to be making much. Uh, uh, we, we think that these are sort of reserve uh, 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 or poised cells that could pot potentially make IL-17. So doing this analysis, we've, uh, again, we're showing a, a snapshot of, of these uh, data. We looked at the MECFS patients, and uh, we uh, found that there was uh, a really a profound increase in the, in the proportion of the CCR6-positive memory cells. So remember that this is where all the TH17 cells and we said, aha, uh -huh, wow, you know, the TH17 cells have, are greatly increased in, this, in these patients. But when we look at the cytokines produced by these cells, uh, we, we actually found exactly the opposite, that the IL-17 levels from these cells were greatly reduced. And, and I have to say that I've been studying this population for many years, and this was probably one of the most profound data that, that we have seen, uh, uh, such, a, such a big difference, uh, perhaps because of the large cohort. Um, but what does this mean? Why, why there are high CCR6 positive and low IL-17? Now, it could be, uh, actually, does, this doesn't necessarily mean there are less TH17 cells. It could also be that they are hyperstimulated and, and sort of, quote unquote, exhausted cells uh, that they don't want to make any more IL-17. These are very dangerous cells, and maybe they're, they're being told to shut up and not, not make more IL-17. But it, clearly it shows that there's something going on, uh, that, that is something is triggering this population, whether it's the microbiota or bacteria or something else. Uh, we don't yet know that answer. Um, and again, when we looked at the age group, this time we saw this disruption. It didn't matter whether you were under the age of 50 or over the age of 50. Uh, there was still a, a, a lower levels of IL-17 producing T cells uh, in the blood of these, uh, these individuals. Okay, and the, the last uh, set of data I want to show you is another subset of, of cells that we call mucosa-associated in invariant T cells or MACE cells. So you'll hear more about this tomorrow from Julia O's, uh, uh, the, a collaboration that we've done with her, and that's, that's mostly published data. Um, so what is unique about these cells is that, as I mentioned earlier, they're unconventional T cells. They don't recognize uh, MHC class one, uh, uh, class one or class two peptides, but instead they recognize bacterial metabolites. Uh, their function is poorly understood, but they are very cytotoxic. They can kill cells that are infected with bacteria. They produce pro-inflammatory cytokines. And we think that they are very important in regulating the microbiota, that they are sort of sensors of the microbiome. Uh, and the, the study that we have done with Julia um, actually provides very good evidence for that. Um, and as I said, they, they recognize these bacterial uh, uh, products. Uh, this is actually vitamin B2 uh, uh, metabolized derived from vitamin B2 pathway uh, that binds to this molecule MR1. And what is also unique about them is that their T cell receptor is invariant in the sense that their alpha chain is, uh, is the same. They, they, ha they all have V alpha 7.2 uh, in humans. Uh, it's a little different in, in mouse. Uh, but the beta can be diverse, but they still seem to recognize the same type of molecules. Another thing that, that identifies them is this molecule called CD161. So if you actually join these two together, uh, you can very clearly identify this population. Or you can use, uh, as Mark Davis uh, showed, a tetramer approach. You can make an MR1 tetramer with, with these uh, bacterial metabolites, and you, will, you can stain them, and it's exactly the same population that you will stain. So doing this, we uh, first looked at the frequency of these cells in patients versus control, um, and there was no difference. But this is actually not surprising, because you can see that even in healthy control, this is probably the, the most diverse uh, um, uh, divergent uh, uh, T cell population that we have seen. 
the, there's almost 50-fold difference between donor to donor. There are some people who have about 45% of their CD8 T cells made up of this one population. There are others about 1.5%. Uh, 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 I'm probably right here. I know I have about 3.4% of made cells. Uh, but what is unique is that that proportion remains the same. So if you have high levels of made cells, that actually uh, sustains itself for a while. Uh, we don't know the reason for this. Uh, it could be because everyone's microbiota is different. So th this person might have a very different type of microbes that they need a lot of made cells there. Uh, again, this is a speculation uh, uh, um, that we don't have direct proof for that. But when we looked at the uh, actual uh, activation or, if you like, differentiation of these cells between patients and healthy, and there we saw uh, quite big differences. So uh, we've looked at uh, made cells that lack this molecule called CD27. Uh, it's not really that important what it is, but it basically cells that are more activated, more differentiated, will lose this molecule CD27, and that proportion of cells were increased in ME-CFS patients uh, very significantly. And furthermore, um, the functionality of these cells appear to be uh, highly perturbed as well, that the proportion of these, so by the way, what is unique about mace cells, they can also make IL-17. That's very unique because they're mostly CD8 cells. The proportion of them that make IL-17 in Tiferon Gamma were, were, again, greatly reduced, very similar to the, what we saw with TH17 population. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the proportion of total interferon gamma producing cells were also reduced. Again, this could suggest that maybe they were hyperstimulated. Again, something that's really bothering them, and they, 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 they don't want to make any more cytokines, perhaps. Again, this is um, uh, speculating here, but that's at least our, our interpretation. Uh, this could very much link, uh, link it to the microbiome. So our, our hypothesis, again, that, that really supports these, by these data, that something is really going on at, at the gut level the, the CD8 uh, data could be very different. Perhaps that's more of a viral origin, um, uh, but, but may, maybe that there is something going on in the gut, in the microbiota, and that's really causing this irritation of the TH17 mate cells. Whether these are, are directly linked to the symptoms of the disease is, remains to be determined, but clearly uh, there, there are some very profound uh, changes in these, uh, in these populations. And again, you know, TH17 cells are involved in autoimmunity as well as mate cells, and perhaps this could suggest some sort of an autoimmune type of, of a T cell response uh, uh, in these patients as well. So the last slide that I want to show is that um, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, much passionate about what we call personalized medicine. Uh, what is personalized medicine and what is precision medicine? There's actually a big initiative in an HIV. Uh, this was really described by Hippocrates two, more than 2,000 years ago. It is far more important to know which person has the disease than what disease the person has. Um, I was trained as a physician uh, in medical school. We were thought to treat the disease, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular, what's, uh, so on. But now we really appreciate that uh, one size does not fit all in medicine. And you really need to stratify and, and really go down to the precision level. Uh, and not, not to mention that such a heterogeneous disease such as ME-CFS, uh, cancer has been leading this in stratifying the groups based on molecular markers, and now you can really target uh, the type of lung cancer that you can target with particular drug will not work in another type of lung cancer, and so on and so forth, and, and we think that this is actually important probably in all diseases except you know, a, a single gene uh, cause uh, rare diseases. Um, and in, and again, we think that there's probably multiple triggers and that, or multiple uh, uh, factors that result in similar type of symptoms in ME-CFS, and we really need to identify and tailor the diagnosis uh, uh, to, to individual pop, uh, person and as well as tailor the, the treatment accordingly. Um, and finally, I want to acknowledge none of this could be possible without uh, the support of NIH. Uh, the, all, all the data that I showed you are from uh, in our one grant that we got from NIAD. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, our studies on the uh, U, uh, U54 grant from uh, uh, NINDS uh, is ongoing, and uh, we'll start uh, soon analyzing some of those data. And of course, uh, uh, Jackson Laboratory has been great support in, in, uh, in our efforts here. Uh, I want to acknowledge my team. Um, some people are not here. Uh, Courtney Gunter and Stephanie Ranzula are here. Uh, they've done uh, great work in analyzing data. AJ Karhan, Lena Kosaya. Uh, all of them contributed to, to this work. 
and uh, you will hear from Julia all tomorrow. Uh, we, we, they're, they're very happy, as you can see here. Uh, they, they are doing our microbiome uh, collaboration and doing really fantastic uh, work. And of course, none of this would be possible without the, the, the patients that were uh, extremely carefully chosen by Cindy Bateman and, and Susan Vernon at Bateman Horn Center. We're really grateful to have such great collab clinical collaborators. Um, and uh, I'd like to point out that we have a blog called jacksmecfs.com. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. Uh, and Jackson Laboratory actually launched uh, a, a very nice series of uh, videos and articles about uh, MECFS research that you can start to read some of that or watch it uh, uh, from this link. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, Courtney Gunter is also our program manager. So I'll stop there. <laughs>